Mirka Hakkinen is a printmaker, designer, illustrator, and children's book author. Not only she excels in several art mediums, she also juggles art making with being a full-time mom of three kids, moving homes every three years, and being an active member of various art communities. You can find Mirka's work at mirka.com. That's M-I-R-K-A-H dot com. Join us today as we talk about how to connect with local artists, even when you're moving every three years, juggling art making and being a full-time mom during COVID times, and Mirka's tip to do art when all you want is to relax. Hi, I'm Anya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etra meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Mirka, please tell us your story. When did art first became a thing for you? Um, you know, that's always kind of a hard question because I feel like it's just always been a part of me. When I was really small, I just loved to draw. And when other kids like to listen to music or, you know, have hobbies, I would just kind of sit at home and draw. And so I did like horses too. So we did do, you know, a lot of, we did horseback riding once a week and, and stuff like that. But the drawing was always kind of just my, my big thing. Is that why you draw horses so well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, when I was little, I would, horses would be like the only thing I drew. I would just draw horses all day long, every day. Me too. Because I did <laughs> horseback riding as well when I was like six. Uh -huh. Oh, I yep. can relate. Yep. And then what? When when did it become more of a thing you wanted to pursue, um, like for real? Well, I think I I I think it's still that real thing that I'm trying to pursue. It, mm -hmm. I, I I'm still kind of trying to get there because I you know when I was little and in Finland you kind of have to decide what you want to do straight out of high school. Mm -hmm. You have to go to a university that is specifically for. I don't know, forestry or engineering, or there's no kind of in America where you can go to college and kind of ch pick and choose different things. And you don't really have to choose what you kind of want to do. You still have time to pick, but in Finland, you have to pick right after high school. And so I, I knew that art was kind of my thing and I didn't have a lot of interest in, I was thinking maybe I could be a horse trainer or a farrier or something like that. That was like my other option of what I thought I could do. Um, so at that point after high school to get some time off to, but try to kind of think about things. I came to America as an international student just to, um, you know, just to, just to try. I, I did the art program at a really tiny little university in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then kind of one thing led to another and I ended up just being there for the whole four years and graduated and, and I took a year off. Um, and then I real, I worked, I got a visa to work for one year after I graduated. And at that point, Um, I realized that I couldn't get a job with an art degree. And so then I went to graduate school and um, and then kind of everything's kind of gone from there. So I don't know if there's been like one thing, just kind of things just kind of lead into each other and you go with the flow and then you just arrive at places you maybe weren't planning that much. I don't know. How scared were you? I mean, going with the flow is it sounds chill, but I find it terrifying. Um, I mean... I don't know. You always have a little bit of a plan. And I always feel like God, God kind of guides me and leads me and takes me to where I need to go. And I kind of trust that. Oh, faith. And, so that's how you yeah. cope. Question. Mm -hmm. So you were born in Finland and you went to mm -hmm. US to study and then got back to Finland? No, I never went back to Finland. I'm still here. So I ah. came here right after high school and I've just ended up staying. I got married right after graduate school, so. Oh, wow. And how did you, so you do two very distinct styles of art. Mm -hmm. You have your uh, watercolor and you have your lino. Mm -hmm. Just for those of us who don't know exactly what lino is, can you just explain that a little bit? Okay, so I just, I figured this would be easier because a lot of people don't, um, haven't seen things like that. So this is just the, the, topmost lino block off my, um, off my 
stack. And so it's mm-hmm. just a, so the, the way the lino carving works, relief printing is you have a, a surface and then you take a tool and you carve into the surface and then whatever comes out is going to be white and whatever is left on the top is going to be black. Um, and then once you have the surface, you just roll up some ink on it and then you, it's basically like stamping a fancy, mm-hmm fancy way of stamping and for bigger tools I use or for bigger pictures bigger mark making I use linoleum and then for smaller mark making I use wood engraving um and then just to kind of I grabbed one of my engraving blocks and you can see so this is if this is lino block then this is my engraving block and the 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 size of the marks that I can make on both is you know the engravings are made I can get maybe at least 10 times smaller marks than I can get with lino cuts. And the same thing with the tools. Um, here, let's see, we have to go really close. So with the lino tool, it's uh, you know a U-shaped gouge tool like you would do with, um, I know it's not focusing so close, but um, it's a U-shaped tool that pulls stuff out. And when you do engraving, it's literally just uh, a really sharp point that just displaces the, the engraving material. So, oh, cool. but it makes Why? the same looking looking marks, but you know, one makes bigger and one makes smaller. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. So you make two di- very different uh, styles of art: the linos uh-huh. and the watercolor. Uh huh. How how did you get there? I mean, some people they work so hard to find their style, and the style is something. I mean, there's a lot of controversy stuff going on with what is your style and if you find it then you'll never let it go but you know you might change it so how you have two styles very distinct how did that happen how did you find them um i i think they're both just me i think i haven't really i haven't really chased what my style is Mm -hmm. i've just whatever kind of comes out of me comes out of me and so i i I feel like the difference between them is function and so Mm -hmm. For my lino cuts and wood engravings, those are more like the fine art style, and I do more of a realistic style in general with it, that. And it's more to show at galleries or, you know, just for a piece of art for your wall. And then with my watercolor, what I usually do is that's for picture book illustration or trying to illustrate something. So that one's more, you know, it has a different function to it. And so, you know, I have a specific way of drawing and you know, it, it maybe doesn't show on both, but when you look at my my relief prints, they all look like my relief prints. And when you look at my watercolors, they all kind of look my, like my watercolors. Um, and now I'm actually starting to do more of a, more of a kind of a different illustration style too. Cause then the water, for a picture book illustration, my watercolor style is my watercolor style. But then I'm also writing a dummy for, a, or a picture book series that's more of a board book and mm-hmm. it needed more very kind of clear board books just need more clear illustrations. Um, they don't need to have all that little, I like to put a lot of little detail in my watercolor illustrations and, and board books just they're for younger audiences and the illustrations need to be clearer. And so for that one, I'm actually starting to do this. Um, it's all done in digital, so it's faster to do and I can put brighter colors um, and it's a little bit more poppy and kind of a retro style. Mm-hmm. Um, illustration and so that's kind of a third thing that I'm working on right now too so. wow wow and do you find cause I don't know because you know, when you focus on something you work so hard on it to get really good at it and you're really good at both your watercolor and your Lena work mm-hmm. so do you work on your art full-time or do you do something else on the side um it I pretty much work on it full-time I mean I have my three children and so I'm, you know, and it's been COVID. They, everybody's been home for a month on end. Um, so, you know, I want to say full time I'm a mom. And then with whatever time I have left over, that's when I do my art. And I don't have anybody hired, you know, to do be a virtual assistant or anything like that. I just do everything myself. And so, at, you know, the last three, four months, there's only been so much work I've been able to do. So definitely everything's taken a hit but then when we're kind of back to you know my two older kids go to school and then my youngest one goes to a part-time daycare um then I'm able to go much more kind of full throttle if we ever go back to a normal school school system yeah <laughs> Person fears that whatever happens is for the best oh goodness yeah. so how did you get from graduate school to full-time mom slash artist uh, well I think the biggest thing was just that 
I got married to the army, really. My husband is in the military. And mm -hmm. so we move every three years. And with the moves, I, I did try to go the traditional track after graduating. I thought, you know, I'm just going to teach at a university and then I'm going to do the art, you know, kind of like I went to a fine art, fine art school. So there was no computers. There was no animation. There was it was just painting and ceramics and sculpture. You know, it was just the traditional arts. And so nothing else was taught in art history. And so, so I thought that's kind of where I was going, even though I always had this thought in my head that I really wanted to see my stuff on, you know, notebooks and, um, you know, and I wanted to do picture book illustration and, and just see my, my like cards that you buy at the museum or whatever. I always had that vision that I wanted to see my art that way. And I thought, well, you know, eventually I'm going to, you know, I'll do all this great work and somebody's just going to find me and want to license my work. And granted that happens to some people, but not to everybody. And so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we got married and we move all the time and it was really hard to kind of hold on to a job while mm -hmm. we move around every two to three years. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing I kind of could do was art. And so I've just been doing art and I've been holding some odd jobs teaching here and there in between, but mostly it's just in the art because that's the only thing that travels wow wow that's that's a wonderful story wow so what so did you try i'm just curious because my mom was married to someone in the army as well and they were moving mm -hmm. every three years even though i stayed she moved out when i first started college but i have a little mm -hmm. sister she was two at the time and i saw how moving affected my little sister's life she's 16 now so it's been for a while mm -hmm. um so have you Did you try having art jobs, like nine to five art jobs before, and then you quit because of the whole every two to three years you're moving? Or did you go full on, you're doing your own thing? Um, I mean, it was pretty much full on doing my own thing. But, you know, obviously that doesn't pay the bills in general. And, you know, so I did try to, so the, all the teaching jobs that I was doing were kind of part-time on the, on the side. And mm -hmm. so like I would teach adjunct, like the first duty station we had, I taught adjunct at two different colleges. Um, and so I would, you know, teach several nights a week and then, but, and back then we didn't have kids. So then I could do art all day and then go and teach, you know, a few classes during the week. Um, and then after I had kids, I would teach um, like out of our garage, I would teach art classes. I would have a studio set up in our garage um, or wow. I would teach at a little art center in town and just have like all my, and it, I would have all my printmaking. I would have a little press over there and like all the paper and we would wheel it all out and set it all up and have the class. And then we would wheel, put it in bins and put it all away. And, oh my and God. so it was, it's so, I, so there's been all these things that I've done over the years and, or I've done, you know, I've, I've talked at some conferences for panels and things like that over the years. Um, but it's so, so that's always been kind of on the side, but the main thing that I've always done has just been, all this art in its random forms. It's And I've done a lot of, of sewing over the oh, years too. Oh, that I did not know. So yeah, so sewing was for a while when my kids were young, I, I actually sewed like baby carriers for a long time, for a couple of years. And then they changed regulations on how those are supposed to be um, manufactured and tested oh. and all that kind of stuff. And, and I don't have, you know, that, that just became so complicated that, you know, I got out of that and just went back to making art more full-time. Wow. Well, you, that's a hustler's life. <laughs> yeah. It, well, I think a lot of artists are kind of hustlers because yeah. you got to, you know, if, if you're trying to stay afloat, you got to get the money in from somewhere. Exactly. But thankfully, thankfully my husband, you know, he does, is able to, you know, support our whole family. So, so I've always been really free in that sense to kind of do what I want to do with my art because, mm -hmm. I've had that support structure behind me. Oh, that's, yeah, that is indeed very helpful. Another thing I find in artists that support themselves with their art only, they go to local conferences and, you mm -hmm. know, when you live in a place for a long time, you can get to go to markets, you know, people, and eventually word comes out and you sell a lot of pieces. You don't have mm -hmm. that luxury because you're moving all the time. So yeah. how do you battle I mean, that? I have Uh, I'm really good at making connections. I mean, I have done a whole bunch of the art fairs and art markets because um, you get to know people and then you get invited and and it's but it's a lot of that is you know going once and 
figuring out if it's a good market and then you either go back the next year or you don't. And a lot of times by the time I find out about that market and try it once, I maybe get a chance to go back to it another time before we have to move. Um, so I've gotten really good over the years of just, you know, as soon as we we arrive somewhere, I just hit the ground running and I go visit all the galleries and check out all the museums. And if there's an artist guild, I, I you know, become a member of that. And I just go around and talk to as many people as I can and start making those connections. Like, yeah, just hit the ground running. So what are your tips on building connections? Um, just be genuinely interested and be, I mean, if you're just fake and you're just out there to, you know, toot your own horn, mm -hmm. people can kind of sniff that out pretty quick. And so for me, it was, it was about my art, but it was always, I wanted to be a part of that community. And so for example, like at the last studio station where we were, we were at in Texas, like I was teaching the classes there was no other printmaker. So I made my own printmaking community. I started teaching classes. I had students who then start bought their own press and started making prints. Um, I, I was trying to meet printmakers from surrounding areas. And we actually end up, there was an art fair that happened every summer. And I actually coined like the whole, we ended up having like this printmaking section. We were kind of shoved off to the side and we had our little printmaking section at the art fair and we did steamroller printing. I, I organized our steamroller printing. We had these giant lino cuts that I, we put together teams who, you know, cut those and brought those in and it just ended up being a big thing. And, and so I built this whole community that was surrounded around kind of printmaking over there. And then and it's still going. And so they, they're they still doing the, the the steamroller printing even after I left. Somebody else kind of took over that. And oh, so wow. it's just, so I tried to, I try to leave that kind of a legacy wherever we've been is I want to be a member of that community and better that community. Um, not to be remembered, but, you know, it's just nice to know that you were able to make a difference. Wow. Wow. Just taking that in. I know, but it's hard when you leave because you have to leave those friends behind. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. But but you have all those good memories. Yeah, that's the best part about life. It's what you take with you. All the mm -hmm. memories. Um, can you tell us about the hardest challenges you faced, all the struggles? What were those? How did you overcome them? Yeah, you sent that question to me beforehand, and I had a really hard time mm -hmm. kind of thinking about it because I feel like I have yet to overcome my hardest struggles. I feel okay. like I, I, there's kind of three. So one of them is like I wanted to like I wanted to for me, the successful artist was I wanted to see my I feel like I'll, I'll be successful when I when I like license and I can see my stuff on postcards and tea towels and without me having to manufacture and like sell everything. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of like where I want to go. Um, and art school definitely did not teach me any steps on how to get there. Um, and I can talk about, you know, how I'm working my way towards that if you want um, mm -hmm. afterwards. And then I think my other um, kind of two other challenges are just being the mom of three. And, and then my third challenge is focus because I like to do, I mean, I've done weaving, I do, you know, watercolor, I do printmaking, I do, I have, you know, I sew. And so there's a lot of hobby craft related things in our house that take up a lot of room. Mm -hmm. um, and just focusing, it's hard to focus on just one thing all the time. So, so those are kind of my big things. And then um, to overcome those, um, I, I did write down some like kind of practical tips on time management and stuff like that. Um, do you want me to go kind of over? Oh, please. You're a mother of three and you do so much. I really want to know everything you have to teach us. Okay. So let me see. I have, so I kind of wrote down, uh, let me see. I did, did put four kind of tips over here. Um, so let's see. So, so obviously I'm not perfect at time management. I have three. Um, and my kids are eight years old. She's going to be nine really soon. And then my six-year-old is going to be seven really soon. And then I have a t terrible two-year-old. Um, she's really cute, but she's definitely, we're potty training. We're almost done potty training and she definitely knows what she wants. Um, so kind of the first thing I wrote down was um, create a routine 
for yourself. So before kids, I used to be, you know, I, I used to be kind of a morning person and I really liked my sleep. Um, I used to be more active and working out. Um, but now with the kids, I've, uh, they're up. Like if I get up early, they're just always up earlier than I am. So there's no point trying to get up early. So what I've done is I actually just work at, at the end of the night. So after the, the kids go to bed, I go into my studio and then I just work. And, and now I'm kind of used to just getting about six hours of sleep every night and it, it seems to be okay. And if I have a really big deadline, then I just push kind of a longer night until about one or two and get a couple of hours of sleep. But then like, I'll take the next night off to kind of, um, you know, recharge. replenish, yeah. yeah, recharge. Um, and I think with that routine is just like going into that studio and working, even if I'm tired or I don't feel there's a lot of nights when I don't feel like, you know, I'm just upset at the kids or just tired or, you know, it's been kind of an awful time in general for world world affairs anyways. And so, you know, that's been really stressful too. Are my kids, what am, am I going to homeschool my kids? What am I going to do with my kids when, you know, August comes? Um, just trying to make all these decisions, but I'll go into my studio and if I don't, you know, I don't always feel, especially lately, I don't, I'm not that creative, but I'll go in there anyways and I'll start, you know, checking, I need to check emails or I need to reply to emails or I have house, you know, other kind of housekeeping to do or galleries that I need to talk to. Um, and then if I need to get work done, I'll just sit down and just start drawing. And even if I don't feel like drawing, I'll just start. And then that inspiration comes, you know, I just kind of get that second wind and I just, and I, and at, at the end of the day, when I'm done working in my studio, when I'm done drawing or whatever I've been doing, I always feel so balanced and so refreshed and so centered that, you know, that, you know, even though I didn't feel like doing it in the beginning, it was worth it in the end. And so just showing up and doing the work, you know, that's just a big thing. Um, and then the second point I had was, you know, kind of related to that is rewarding myself. Um, because a lot of times I don't feel like going to the studio, just going into my studio, I will reward myself. And so for me, that's, you know, I, I try not to drink soda, but I drink the sparkly water. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I go into my studio, I'll have either like I have my teacup right here or I'll have a sparkling water and I'll like sip on that while I'm working. And, and I don't know, it, it's a reward for me. And so, so you know, just doing those little things or having a little snack, like I'll grab a cheese stick on my way in or mm -hmm. something like that. And I think just the act of e eating or drinking something, I don't know, it makes you feel happy and then you just yep. get more work done. So doing a little reward system for myself or if I've worked really hard, I I don't know if I really feel guilty about getting giving my time self time off, but like if I finish a big project or I finish like a dummy and I worked on it really hard for several nights, like I'll give myself a time off and watch TV at the end of the night in, yep. instead of feeling guilty that I'm not working my studio. So also remembering to take time off yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yourself. And I love that you mentioned yeah. that thing about uh, giving yourself a little slack snack when you eat. I do something similar. Um, I read about, um, I don't know if you know this book, Power of Habit. Mm -mm. Oh, they talk a lot about how to make, uh, I don't remember the author, but I will add it as a link in the blog uh -huh. post associated with this episode. But it talk about how our brain works and how we can create habits for ourselves or re replace habit habits with something else, like mm -hmm. bad habits with good habits and such. And it's all about, um, a re it, it, like the way the brain works, it works a lot of, around a, a um, reward system. So if mm -hmm. you get the trigger and you know that the reward is going to be a cheese stick. Uh -huh. Then, you know, when you smell the cheese stick, then you immediately start doing the habit. It's like when people people who smoke, they, they smell the smoke and they just grab a cigarette. Mm -hmm. It's it's the trigger that is that is working and that's what creates the habit. So if, yeah, I'm not saying people go ahead and eat Doritos or something, but yeah. If, <laughs> I mean, I, the sparkling water is great. No calories and it's healthy. There you go. So that's kind of my, it, and it's not even a guilty pleasure because it's not guilty. And so, yeah. So that's like for me, when I open that sparkly water, it's science. you know, and I sip on that, like, that's just, it makes me feel good. And then I'm just happier working in there my studio. Go. And there so go. I wish I could yeah. go on a three hour rant about time management and habit yeah. stuff, but okay. <laughs> Moving forward. You said okay. you, we wanted to share, uh, what steps you're taking towards getting, you know, being licensed. Mm -hmm. So please, can you share that with us? 
Um, so, well, it's still a work in progress, but mm-hmm. like the biggest thing that I'm working on right now, well, I've taken, when I first graduated from undergraduate school, there was no kind of classes. There's an online learning kind of wasn't a thing. It was just, you go to school and you learn stuff. Um, but now in the last, you know, 10 years, it, it all this online education has really taken off. And so right now I'm taking a class with Stacy Bloomberg, who's from, she's the owner of Gingerbur. Mm-hmm. And so she's taken a, she's put a class together called Leverage Your, Your Art. And so that is, and so in that class, she's talking a lot about how, basically how she's built her business and how she's doing her licensing. And cause I just have no insight. Like, I don't know who to contact or how to, do you present a portfolio or how do you do anything? And so we've, we, we've just done just the first um, week in the, it's an eight week class. And I've already learned so much about, you know, how to put a fabric collection together and what does it look like and what should it include? And cause fabric is also one thing that's kind of like on that bucket list of things that I want to, <laughs> you know, work on eventually. And so, so yeah, so I'm just learning a lot. And so every week there's a different theme and we're learning different things. And so it's just, I'm really, really looking forward to. So that's kind of my big, so I'm hoping that's going to give me the tools that I need to really get my act together and, you know, get the next step in my career. So, awesome. Okay, what made you grow the most as an artist? And I know this is a trick question for you because you have so many stuff that you do. So the things that kind of made me grow as an artist, I was thinking there's kind of my internal growth and then there's my external growth. Hmm. And so I think, or internal triggers for growth, I guess I should say. And so internally, I, I feel like it's, I just have that spirit that can't be quelched. Like I will just, like it, when I hit the wall and I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just going to look for different ways on how I can go forwards. I'm just always going to take step forwards. And sometimes they, it might not be in the right direction, but then I'll course correct and then I'll take another step in a different, you know, I'm always trying to move. I'm never going to be just going, I'll never give up until I get there and then I'll be happy to get there. So there's like an internal motivation and a drive that will just not let go. So that's that's kind of a big thing. And then second of all, the two other things external that have really made me grow is, you know, the moving all the mm-hmm. time is it's it's really stretched my people skills. I've had to learn in Finland, we don't do small talk. And so I've really had to learn how to network and connect with people in, in constantly, you know, we're, we've lived in d- different countries, we've lived in different states. And in America, different states have different cultures. There's, you know, everybody's just really different no matter where you live. We lived in Texas, yeah. Georgia, Seattle. I've lived in Illinois and then we've lived in Germany and now in Hawaii. Our next oh place is going to be Korea, Korea. And so what? So every place you go, it's going to be a different culture and you you just have to you just have to go. And so that has really helped me grow as just you know, learning how to read people and you know just 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 get going and then you know the last thing is my kids obviously like they stretch my patience on a daily basis and so <laughs> i have had to grow as a person i have had to grow in um in the way i'm efficient and you know i can't i don't have all day to work on stuff i have you know about three hours maybe four hours at the end of the day and everything has to get done during that time and maybe nap time but you know, as the kids get older, nap times go away or they get shorter. And so you can't rely on the nap times like I used to when they were, you know, smaller. And so, so yeah, kids definitely stretch you in all sorts of ways that you never thought you could be stretched. I can empathize with this so much. <laughs> yeah. For the first time I'm empathizing with moms. Oh my goodness. You're going to Korea? Yeah. Next year. In my mind, you were moving across the United States, not going to Korea. Oh my God. Ah, take that moment. <laughs> and and just one more question: How did you? Mm-hmm. Where do you? How did you learn to be so? You know, to push yourself so hard and, and to go for it. You're such a go getter. Where did that come from? I I that's just me. I don't know. I you just have to you just have to push to get what you want. I think I I I think it's the Finnish sisu. Is we just have this. The saying in Finland that your will will take you through a gray rock, basically, that, you know, if if there's a will, there's a way. And that's just 
kind of, I, I feel like this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I have this drive and passion inside me that like, it just can't be, it, nothing can squish that, like nothing can take that away. And, and I just have to keep driving. I have to keep going and eventually I'll get to where I need to be. Oh, any last words of encouragement for our listeners? Um, be kind to yourself and forgive yourself. Um, nothing happens overnight and you just, you know, everybody's going to make mistakes and we're not perfect and you just forgive yourself. And, and, you know, cause I'm so driven and I'm, I can, we can be so unforgiving. Like we're our own worst critics and yeah. just, you know, if you have kids, you just have to give yourself that grace that you're not the perfect mom, you're not the perfect artist, and you just do the best you can and and, and pray to God to guide you. And hopefully everything will work out itself in the end. How do you stay focused? Mirka is a go-getter who's used to relentlessly pursuing her goals. However, this kind of focus isn't innate to everyone. What is your favorite tip to staying on target? Share it in the blog post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Mirka. That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B dot com forward slash M-I-R-K-A. Like the podcast? Help us support the show by subscribing and giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. See you in the next episode and until then, let's make more art!